Um, and so I hope that this framework, you'll use it during the case studies, um, and it'll be circulated to you after this Zoom session. Uh, but now I'd like to invite my colleague Amy to talk a little bit more about Zoom. Um, so the pros, the cons, uh, sorry, not the cons, the cautionary tales, <laughs> and the opportunities that this great platform really affords for education. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna um, go advance to the next slide. I don't know, can I? There we go. Um, so I've just taken a screenshot of what my Zoom page would look like as um, a facilitator. Um, to go through some of the key features, because if you've only attended a Zoom meeting as an attendee, then it would look a little bit different. Um, so we'll go through just the, uh, the items that are listed here on the screen. So um, getting a Zoom account, so anyone can sign up for a Zoom account. So I can see from the chat that there uh, are some people affiliated not necessarily with McMaster. So getting an account um, would be through the zoom.us website if you haven't already signed up for one. Um, McMaster, for those teaching through McMaster, does have a site license and so they've asked us if we're teaching through McMaster to go through um, the UTS. There's a, a page through um, technology services to request a Zoom um, McMaster account for those who are teaching with McMaster. Um, and that's sort of the first step. Um, once you've got a Zoom account, as Sarah has talked about, there's a number of features that you have to enable in advance. Um, and once you've done that in advance, can um, change some of the icons uh, and buttons that are sort of down at the bottom. Um, so the first thing that you'll need to do once you get an account is to log back into that account on the web portal um, and actually start scheduling your meeting. So a few tips around scheduling. Um, so you need to set up a number of features in advance through that scheduling portal. Um, I would recommend setting up recurring meetings if you've got weekly classes. Um, that helps so that you then don't have to send out the link week by week by week, but you can send out the link once to students or your learners. Um, so I'm doing a 12 week PBL and I've only had to send, I'm on class five tomorrow, have only had to send a link out once and it continues to, to work. So there's an option to click off when you're scheduling your meeting um, to set up a recurring meeting and it'll ask you to set up how often. So I find that's very helpful and it prevents you from having to then send a link out multiple times um, if you're, you're meeting weekly with um, students or learners. Um, it's very easy then once your meeting has been set up to copy and send the link. There's a button to copy and paste it to send it to people. Um, the other button that you can use is the little eye icon that's at the top left of our screen um, right now. So on my button it would be here. Um, and that'll also give you the meeting information sort of in real time. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of meetings that I've attended where I get last minute emails from people. What's the link? I know we're supposed to be meeting. I can't remember. Um, and then I've got to log out or sort of get out of Zoom, go in my email, find out where the link was or log back into the web portal. So that's a quicker way that, that the little uh, information icon could quickly just copy the, the meeting um, to send it to somebody who's needing to join sort of last minute or who might get disconnected and need to reconnect. Um, so that's sort of a quicker way to have the, the copy and paste function right there. Um, so your meeting information button is there. Um, the other things that you can set up while you're scheduling, there's a number. I can't go through everything because there's lots. I would really recommend playing around with the features on Zoom, get your family to do a Zoom meeting where you're the facilitator first, just to see what things look like um, and get used to um, how to set things up. There's lots of options and I find it's fairly intuitive. I'm not hugely tech savvy, but I'm able to navigate quite well. Um, so um, audio and video settings for participants, so you can set whether or not you want them to have video or audio or just the host. Um, you can set up some of the security features, which we'll get down to security. Um, there's a security button um, in a live meeting, but there are some functions that you can set up ahead of time. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in the cautionary tales. But you're able to um, uh, set up a, a waiting room. You can um, disable um, that students or learners can't join before the host. So you can't have people sort of sitting in your meeting ahead of time. Um, you can set it up so that you require um, users to have a password to get into the meeting and I would highly recommend doing that for all your meetings and that just decreases the risk that someone randomly out there could guess what your meeting ID is and get into your meeting. Um, the other option is that you can um, lock another security feature is to lock the room. So once you know that everybody, um, if it's students in your class is in and you sort of take an attendance or um, you can also lock the room so that people then can't get in without sort of um, knocking or asking. Um, other options that you can set up when you're scheduling is whether or not um, uh, participants will be able to screen share. 
You can also set that up on the fly. Um, so I sort of enabled the security button on my screenshot here that you can quickly either enable or disable screen share, but you can also set that up in advance. Um, enabling breakout rooms. Um, so I have the breakout room button on my screen down here um, at the bottom, um, but I had to set that up ahead of time. It took me a while to, to figure out when I was first using this. So that is something that you have to enable um, when you've scheduled your meeting um, and also have to enable when you've um, created your account that you want um, to create breakout rooms. Um, and then the breakout rooms can either be done on the fly, you can assign people randomly, uh, breakout rooms can be um, pre-assigned in advance. So if you know that you already want to put people into certain groups, you can assign them um, by uh, email address. Um, the trick with that is then the learners have to use the same email address that you've, you've used for them. So I have about half my class who the breakout rooms pre-assigned will work and the other half haven't logged in with a McMaster email um, and I uh, have to manually assign them, but that's the other option. You can manually assign them and it works quite quickly, um, even on the fly to be able to assign people to breakout rooms. Um, other functions, um, you can automatically set up to record the meeting. So Teresa's recording this and she hit the record button sort of listed at the bottom, but you can automatically have it set up so that if you know you want to pre-record um, lectures and you know we want to make sure that you don't forget <laughs> to do it, you can set it up ahead of time. Um, another thing that you'll need to enable um, ahead of time, I don't have it, I just enabled it after I did this screenshot, um, is the polling feature. So if you want to add a poll, you need to enable that in your account and then within that scheduled meeting you need to scroll down and actually add in your polling questions so i have a little bit more about that but wanted to just go through that in terms of um, the things you need to set up in advance um, through the scheduling um, once you've um, sort of started the meeting um, like i said the meeting icons on the top left your participants so um, i have to take attendance in the classes that i'm teaching so it's nice to have the participant list that's sort of listed there um, the chat function um, again can be um, uh, visible on the side or not, depending on how much screen room. I always find I'm sort of finding, um, running out of screen room to be able to see all my learners. So even just managing how many widgets are sort of open at a time can be um, tough. Um, the chat, you can enable that ahead of time to be saved. Um, so if you um, are having students sharing ideas or sharing files in the chat, that you can um, automatically have that enabled so that the chat can be saved um, if that's something that you either want to save and send out to people. Um, that has to be saved um, uh, ahead of time. So I've talked a little bit already about some of the security features um, that you can set up ahead of time. Um, the security button down here when you're live in a meeting, you can lock it. Um, so usually, you know, five, 10 minutes after my class has started, I might hit that lock button then. Um, and then I can allow or disallow, enable or disable um, whether or not I want participants to screen share, chat, whether they can change their name. Again, if I need to make sure, um, it is quite different without being able to see everybody's faces. So I'm having, it's taking me longer to learn my students' names. So it is nice to make sure that they have their proper name <laughs> um, listed. So if they can rename themselves, if they're, um, you know, iPad or, um, and actually put their names, it does help. And the participants can do that under the, the participant bar um, and change their names there. Um, and again, you can enable or disable whether or not um, students can unmute themselves or whether that has to be done by the host. Um, so again, the breakout rooms, the button, you have to enable it in advance, but the breakout rooms, um, you can hit that button and uh, it will ask you to pre-assign or it will ask you whether you want to randomly assign people or manually assign and you just hover over their name and uh, assign them to a group and it'll ask you how many groups that you want to create. Um, the whiteboard function. Um, so the whiteboard function I can show because I think I can screen share here if people aren't familiar. I don't want to get out of the press. So the wait, get out of it and demonstrate and come back. So um, is it okay if I show the whiteboard? Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Yeah, I didn't know how much back and forth to do from the presentation. And <laughs> All you want. So I'm teaching PBL, so I feel the whiteboard is a a good function to have when we're concept mapping or generating ideas. So. You can draw, you know, type in text or whatever you like. You can um, change uh, the color. You can add um, drawings. Um, you can add, and then there's a, the function to save. It doesn't need to be set up ahead of time, but you can actually just click the save button and then send that to students if you needed to. So the whiteboard, I find, especially for applications related to PBL when we're doing a lot of concept mapping or brainstorming, um, the whiteboard's a good um, a good function, and then you're not necessarily changing between too many applications as well, too. <laughs> Thanks, Teresa. Um, okay, so I'll stop sharing that. I'm going to go back to our slides. Um, 
Uh, polling, I just want to talk about tiny a little bit more about polling. So uh, polling again has to be set up in advance. You can't do that sort of on the fly and the button would end up um, at the bottom of the screen. So you can add a number of polls. Polls can have a couple different questions. If you wanted to add in a couple of multiple choice questions about certain content, you could add one poll that had a couple different questions. Um, and then you would just click on the polling um, button um, and it would pop up the poll question that you wanted to ask and it would poll um, the users in real time. Um, you can also then share the results with students um, and then you can reset it and poll again. So if I don't know you wanted to do sort of a pre and post, you could poll at the beginning of the class and poll later to see if their answers change sort of towards the end of the class. Um, but I did find um, if you want the questions to show up separately, it needs to be created as two separate polls because if you add two or three or four questions under one poll, they'll all pop up together um, when I was sort of playing around with the polling function. So. Um, so major concerns um, uh, that people are worried about um, and then we've put in some sort of workarounds or some tips or ideas that we might have about addressing those worries. Um, so decreased learner engagement um, has been a, a big concern sort of discussed even in our pre-survey uh, but also in the literature around um, online learning um, and just some ideas that we thought about around um, increasing learner engagement as the environment online is a bit different. Um, is really discussing those upfront, establishing those norms with your group, um, establishing some of those group contact rules. You know, I had a chat with my students about, you know, I want to make this as interesting for you. So I'm really going to rely on you guys to be involved and be active and, and participate in discussion. Um, I do find the use of video. Um, and again, I understand concerns about bandwidth and things as well, but if students can leave video on, I do find it's helpful um, because of that ability to even get some nonverbal facial expressions, thumbs ups from people, um, even if they're not, uh, don't have their microphone on, but having that, that video I find actually does give me some feedback and, and um, input as to whether or not the learners are staying engaged. Um, really working on building in opportunities for engagement. So again, using those breakout rooms, um, if students are reluctant to talk in a big larger group, then um, having them sort of move off into a breakout room, even for five minutes as a sort of think, pair, share kind of activity, building in opportunities for discussion questions, um, having opportunities um, if people are in breakout rooms or doing small group work um, to have note taking, whether that's through Google Doc and sharing summaries that they're set off in those breakout rooms and actually have a task that has to keep them engaged um, and building in those opportunities as you design um, your lesson. Um, and then even encouraging the use of um, chat for participation. I'm thinking particularly even in um, larger group sessions where um, having everybody um, chime in verbally might be a little bit difficult, but even using um, the chat for participation is one um, at least benefit I find with online um, teaching that if people have um, quieter students that sometimes typing might even um, encourage them to participate more so than they would be comfortable putting their hands up in a, in a live session. Um, security concerns. Um, again, I think Zoom has responded a lot um, uh, as we all sort of quickly moved online in mid-March. Um, and I sort of discussed a number of these. So um, when you set up your meeting, making sure that there's a meeting password that's there um, as an extra security feature. Um, enabling the waiting room. So as the host, you have some control over who is admitted into that meeting. Um, disabling the join before host option, um, locking the meeting after it's begun, um, and disabling the option for attendees to share a screen. Um, I don't necessarily do that, um, but again, if it was a, a really large meeting and you wanted to make sure that, that um, someone wasn't able to get in and then share their screen, then um, that would be another good security feature um, to be able to do. And then some pros, um, I think we hear a lot about the cons, but I think there are a number of pros and what you could be excited about too. Um, I think online gives us a number of opportunities to engage in a new way with learners. Um, I mean, the commute's better, right? With online teaching, you save a lot of time. Um, so overcoming challenges due to location and timing. I think if, as everyone's very busy, you know, there's, everyone can think of an example of a time where you couldn't attend a meeting because you were, you couldn't be two places at the same time, right? Being online affords you a little bit more of that opportunity. Um, so challenges related to location and timing um, uh, are easier to overcome um, online, I think. 
Um, again, the breakout rooms for small group discussion. Not that you couldn't necessarily do small group discussion in person, um, but I'm thinking even about physical barriers, about some of the rooms that you might get or rooms that you're assigned, especially in larger groups, if they're lecture style seating, um, breaking out into small groups when your chairs can't turn and you don't have tables um, and the physical space just doesn't allow for that um, can be a challenge. Um, and so breakout rooms are great to be able to do that online. Um, I think it does afford some alternate ways for participation, especially for quieter learners. Um, I teach first year students who, you know, coming into our nursing program are 17 or 18 years old and often very <laughs> um, quiet and shy. And I think even just encouraging them um, breakout rooms in smaller groups, um, easing them in with sort of the chat function, it just gives an opportunity for quieter learners or in larger groups for people's um, voice to be heard. Um, and online teaching, not necessarily with Zoom, but overall really has, I think, increased our ability to share information. So again, not unique to Zoom, but being able to share files, um, videos, posts, resources, sort of in real time, um, I think has really increased our ability to share um, information in an online environment, which we might not necessarily be, always be able to do face-to-face. Um, -face. I think, again, now everyone sort of has a laptop and is online and that sharing um, can happen in real time, but uh, online definitely affords that uh, as a bonus.